And we're starting off the list with Ted Bundy. Not a name you'd ever associate with innocence. Ted Bundy was one of the most notorious uh, sadistic criminals in American history. Between 1974 and 78, he took the lives of 30 young women, possibly more, across seven different states. He'd lure his victims using his charismatic personality, taking them to a secluded location before attacking and restraining them, loading them into his car and taking them away, never to be seen again. Pure evil can often look charming and innocent on the outside, but in Bundy's case it goes a step further. Bundy actually worked on a hotline that helped prevent people from taking their own lives. Yeah, he was one of the folks taking those calls. Pretty noble work. On the outside you'd look at someone like that and be like, wow, you're a fantastic person. Convincing people to go on living, that it's worth having them here. Incredibly ironic that Bundy spent time talking to people on the phone, convincing them to keep themselves alive, when in his own time he'd ignore his victims pleas to stay alive. Completely bonkers. If you are liking our channel so far, then don't forget to uh, you know leave your comments and thoughts below. I like uh, hearing what you guys have to say. At number nine, we have Jim Jones. Jim Jones was one of the most notorious cult leaders in history, responsible for convincing 918 people to take their own lives, and actually a significant portion of those people were forced to do it. He was a charismatic leader who gathered a very large following, but he started showing uh, his dark side, turning what he originally sold as this peaceful quote-unquote uh, socialist paradise into a full-on dictatorship. People couldn't even leave the settlement and he surrounded the place with armed soldiers. Yeah, very democratic. And this all culminated in the aforementioned Jonestown Massacre. Before all this madness though, Jim Jones was known as an outspoken activist. He even worked as the director of the Human Rights Commission in Indianapolis. Depending on people's political views, he would have either looked like a menace or a hero, but I don't think anyone would have predicted things to go the way they did. At least not uh, early on, anyway. Next on the list we have Dennis Rader. This guy was a Boy Scout leader. He was a member of the Lutheran Church, actually the president of the church council. On the outside, he was a dedicated family man, an upstanding member of the Wichita, Kansas community. He was also a despicable monster. Between 1974 and 91, he took the lives of at least 10 people, possibly more. And he loved what he did so much that he actually gave himself his own nickname, B. BTK. Just give that a quick Google to find out what it stands for. Not pretty. It's people like this that really test my faith in uh, humanity. Gaining everyone's trust, having this outward image of being a good, decent human being, when really it's just a complete facade. It's it's also cases like this that make me roll my eyes whenever someone goes, oh, but he could, he could never do that. He's not like that. Well, he can, and he did. Finding despicable people with an innocent facade was not difficult. It would uh, have been much harder to form a list of evil people who were always suspected of being so. Number seven, Dr. Harold Shipman. We put our trust into our doctors, helping to keep us in good health and providing care and reassurance in the worst of times. Doctors are often thought of not just as good people, but great people. Highly respected and highly appreciated, most of the time anyway. But reality goes to show that no matter how green and majestic a field is, there's always a bad apple somewhere in there. Dr. Harold Shipman was responsible for the deaths of around 218 patients between 1972 and 1998, and this wasn't due to negligence. These deaths were carried out on purpose, earning him the nickname Dr. Death. He mainly targeted elderly female patients, administering lethal doses of diamorphine and writing off their deaths as old age or falsifying their medical records to show that they had been in poor health when in reality they were perfectly fine when they came in. A fellow doctor, Dr. Linda Reynolds, uh, started becoming suspicious of Shipman as he had a high number of patients dying off while in his care. He was arrested in 1998 and convicted for the deaths of 15 patients. He hanged himself in his cell in 2004. Next on the list is John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy committed heinous crimes while concealing his dark side behind an innocent facade. Gacy was, an, was active in his community, often participating in local events and children's parties as a clown. Now, clowns are often associated with horror nowadays, partially thanks to this creep, uh, but back then the whole maniacal clown thing wasn't really a thing. 
as much anyway. On the surface, Gacy appeared to be friendly and charismatic. He was involved in charitable activities and was well liked by his neighbors. But as we all know, Gacy was actually a predator. Gacy would restrain his victims and have his way with them before finally asphyxiating them. He buried some of his victims beneath his house discarded others nearby rivers. In 1978, Gacy's crimes were finally exposed when the disappearance of Robert Peace led police to investigate Gacy. They, there, they discovered evidence of his gruesome acts, including personal belongings of some of his missing uh, victims and decomposing bodies beneath his house. Gacy was arrested, tried, and sentenced to death in 1980. And in our number five spot is Charles Cullen. Once again, another man in the medical field who betrayed the trust of his patients. Cullen worked as a nurse in multiple hospitals across New Jersey. Over a span of 16 years, from 1987 to 2003, he caused the deaths of a minimum of 40 patients. He would administer lethal doses of medications like insulin to his victims. He deliberately targeted elderly, sick, or vulnerable patients. His motivations, still somewhat murky, leading to various speculations. Some believe his actions were driven by a desire for control. Others suggest a warped sense of mercy, with Cullen claiming he was sparing his victims from further suffering. Cullen's malevolent spree went unnoticed for years until a vigilant co-worker observed some of his suspicious behavior and authorities were alerted, leading to his arrest in 2003. In 2006, Cullen was brought to justice and sentenced to 11 consecutive life terms in prison. Next up, we have Nanny Doss, AKA the Giggling Granny. This case always creeped me out. Uh, you know who you never expect to try and end your life? A sweet, smiling old lady. If you were all alone with a friendly old granny and God told you someone in the room was evil, you'd probably be the one pleading for forgiveness. Doss presented herself as a loving and caring woman, but behind her innocent smile lurked something dark and sinister. Over a span of several decades, Doss poisoned four of her husbands, her mother, and several other family members, including her sister and grandchildren. She used various substances like arsenic and rat poison to get the job done, and her outwardly caring and nurturing appearance allowed her to evade suspicion for years. Her crimes finally became known in 1954, though, after the suspicious deaths of her family members raised concerns amongst authorities. Traces of poison were discovered in the victims' bodies, leading to Doss's arrest. In 1955, Nanny Doss pleaded guilty to the unaliving of her fifth husband and was sentenced to life in prison. Later in 63, she confessed to her other crimes, providing all the details about her methods and motives. Doss spent the remainder of her life behind bars, dying in prison in 1965. All right, you'd never expect to die at the hands of your grandmother, so the same can probably be said about the very woman who gave birth to you. Next up, we have Mary Beth Tinning. Mary Beth Tinning, born on September 11, 1942, was responsible for the deaths of several of her own offspring, who seemed to die under suspicious circumstances. Tinning would explain the deaths as natural or accidental, deflecting suspicion while continuing to appear as a loving, caring mother. The suspicions surrounding Tinning uh, intensified after numerous family members died unexpectedly. In 85, Tinning's crimes finally came to an end when her daughter Tammy Lynn died under dubious circumstances. She was convicted for the death of Tammy Lynn, but never officially for the deaths of eight others. Uh, she was eventually released on parole in 2018. Javed Iqbal. He was responsible for the disappearance of numerous individuals, mainly young boys whom he preyed upon. Between 1998 and 99, Iqbal lured multiple vulnerable young people, mainly runaways. He then subjected them to unspeakable acts before disposing of their remains, dismembering them before dissolving them in vats of hydrochloric acid. Iqbal presented himself as an ordinary individual, a hardworking businessman. But Finally, in 1999, he sent a letter to the authorities confessing to his crimes, providing gruesome details about his victims and their fate. He and his accomplice were found dead in their cells in 2001. It was stated that they took their own lives, although it was obvious that that was not the case. But did anyone care to investigate any further? No. And 
who could blame them, honestly. Finally, we have Christopher Lee Watts. Not only is this guy a complete and utter monster, he's also incredibly stupid. Uh, Chris Watts seemed on the outside to be a loving father and husband. His neighbors saw him as unassuming, quiet, a decent family man. And what makes this case extra disturbing is that there's plenty of footage from before his heinous crime took place that shows him with his daughters, seems to love them deeply. He just looks like a happy father. It's almost impossible to imagine him doing what he did when you watch that footage. If you don't know the story, Chris Watts uh, started having an affair with a woman named Nicole Kessinger uh, and wanting to start a new life with her, Chris decided to take the life of his wife and his two daughters, claiming they had disappeared with his wife Shannon having left her wedding ring behind. You know, yeah, great plan because you couldn't just get divorced or anything. Completely maddening. I absolutely hate this prick, even though we're completely aware of the double lives people can lead, that no matter how sweet and just someone seems on the outside, they could be hiding something truly dark within. Watching him hug his daughters, you just can't wrap your head around it. It's easy to see how people fall into the traps of sadistic maniacs or get caught up in dangerous cults or start a family with the love of your life, never suspecting for a second that the person you've built a life with has actually been a monster the entire time. Coming in at number 10 is Gavin Smith. In December 2020, teen Gavin Smith ended the lives of his mother, stepfather, and two younger brothers. He was dating Rebecca Walker, and their parents didn't approve of their relationship. Now, the day of the crime, Rebecca was on a video chat call with Gavin, who was at his house. She said that he showed her a firearm and a knife over the video chat, and she knew what he had planned. When Rebecca was asked if she encouraged Gavin to commit the crime, she said, I was on the video chat with him. I didn't tell him, but I was texting him on the video chat. I told him to hurry up and do it. Now, Gavin was found guilty of first degree homicide on three counts and guilty of the lesser offense, second degree homicide on one. He was sentenced to three life sentences for the first degree homicide convictions, 40 years in prison for a second degree homicide, and 10 years for the use or imprisonment of a firearm during the commission of a felony. Now, due to him being a teen at the time of the crime, he will automatically be eligible to see a parole board in 15 years. Number 9. Mary Beth Davis Mary Beth Davis is a former nurse who was convicted of the deaths of her daughter and son in 1997. In September 1981 in Lewisburg, West Virginia, her son Seth had suffered massive damage to his brain, which prosecutors believed was caused by an injection of a large amount of insulin. He was later moved to a mental institution where he spent the rest of his life. Now, Several months after the incident with Seth, on March 11, 1982, her daughter Tegan died of a caffeine pill overdose. Dr. Ann Hooper, who performed the autopsy on the girl, found hundreds of capsules inside the digestive tract. In 1997, Mary Beth was put on trial for the death of Tegan and injury to Seth. It was reported that prosecutors believe that she suffered from Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Mary Beth received a life sentence without the possibility of parole, and Seth Davis then died on October 10, 2002 at the age of 21, and his death was recorded as a homicide. Now, after signing a plea deal and giving a one-word confession in 2007, Mary Beth was released from prison. Number 8. Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoaf Skylar Nisi was a teenager who disappeared from her home in Star City, West Virginia around midnight on July 6, 2012. She was initially considered by law enforcement authorities to be a runaway, and an Amber Alert was not immediately issued in connection with her disappearance. Now, The break in the case came when Rachel, Skylar's best friend, admitted to plotting with Sheila to end Skylar's life. Now, The motivation Rachel gave for the death was they didn't like her and they didn't want to be friends with her anymore. David Nisi stated that these two girls were among his daughter's best friends and that Sheila had even helped the family by distributing missing person flyers. Now, After her confession, Rachel led investigators to Skylar's body. Skylar's body was found less than 30 miles away from her home. Rachel pleaded guilty to second degree homicide on May 1st, 2013 and was sentenced to 30 years in prison with eligibility for parole after 10 years. Sheila pleaded guilty to first degree homicide on January 24th, 
2014 and was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for parole after 15 years. Number 7. Jody Hunt On December 1, 2014, Jody Hunt snapped and ended the lives of four people in West Virginia. He wrote a lengthy Facebook post about how broken hearted he was just hours before the shootings. He said, I am deeply hurt by the events that lead up to this day. I did not choose to have the love of my life go behind my back and sleep with several guys. He adds, you will not hurt me anymore and his rant goes on as he thanks Lisa's family. In conclusion, he begs for someone to take good care of his dogs. Jody, the owner of a towing company, ended the lives of his partner, his business rival, his ex-girlfriend, and the woman's new boyfriend. Jody was then found dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound in his car along US Route 19. Now, Despite his death, West Virginia State Police Lieutenant Michael Bayless told the Associated Press that detectives had to sit down and piece all those puzzle pieces together and find out how all of this happened. Number 6. James Childers On June 1, 2009, a packet containing letters and an audio tape confession from James Childers was delivered to the Clarksburg Police Station, most of which consisted of incoherent ramblings, but also had him admitting to committing five deaths and four arsons that had occurred in the last few years. He did not express remorse for what he had done and said that his misanthropic views were the motive, emitting an extensive resentment, paranoia, distrust, and anger directed towards everybody around him, including relatives. In the tape, James claimed that he had buried four of the victims on the family farm in Braxton County and another discarded in Barber County. A few hours after listening to the tapes, officers were dispatched to the locations and to their horror, they found two skeletal female corpses. Shortly after these discoveries, police issued an arrest warrant for James, who was last seen at the townhouse motel in Clarksburg. The following day, numerous officers had surrounded the motel, but upon learning this, James shot himself in the head. After confirming his death, investigators, together with dog handlers, combed through the farm, where, according to James's testimony, there were at least three other people buried, but no further remains were found. Number 5. Bobby Joe Long Bobby Joe Long would use newspaper ads to find vulnerable women, and if the women were alone when he arrived at their home, he would take advantage and rob them. He took advantage and ended the lives of at least 10 women, though prosecutors believed him to be connected to as many as 50 other crimes across the Tampa, Florida area. The first of his slayings happened in March 1984. The first body discovered by the police were the remains of Nguyen Thai Long, who had recently quit her job as an exotic dancer and planned to go back to school. Bobby lured her into his car by offering her a ride. He drove her to a back road where he took advantage of her and then strangled her to death. Now, One of his other victims, Lisa McVeigh, escaped and it wasn't until she saw a forensic drawing of him on TV that she recognized him as her kidnapper. She relayed this information to the officer handling her case and Bobby was arrested 12 days later. After a lengthy trial and multiple appeal attempts, Bobby was sentenced to death and executed by lethal injection at Florida State Prison on May 23, 2019 and he had no final words. Number 4. Retta Mays In June 2015, Retta Mays began working as a nursing assistant at the Lewis A. Johnson Veterans Medical Center in Clarksburg, West Virginia with no certification or license to care for patients. She started to work overnight shifts on Ward 3A of the hospital's medical surgical unit and elderly patients began suffering mysterious acute drops in their blood sugar level which resulted in many deaths. Now, the hospital began an internal investigation of 11 deaths and she was fired from the hospital in June 2018 and the investigation was turned over to the Inspector General for the United States Department of Veterans Affairs and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, the investigation into the deaths lasted over two years and Retta remained free. She was questioned three times during the course of the investigation and each time she denied any involvement in the deaths. Then in July 2020, she was then arrested and charged with the deaths of eight individuals. The charges were later reduced to seven second degree homicides and one count of intent to commit homicide. On May 11th, 2021, she was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences plus 20 years. Now, in addition to her sentence, she was ordered to pay $172,624 and 96 cents to the victim's families, the VA hospital, Medicare, and insurance companies. Number three, Krista Pike. Krista Pike is the youngest female ever to be sentenced to death in the US when she was just 18 years old. Krista became jealous of her classmate, university student Colleen Slummer, who she thought was trying to steal her boyfriend from her. Upon a meetup at a secluded location, Colleen was attacked by Krista while her friend acted as lookout. According to later court testimony, for the next 30 minutes, Colleen was taunted, beaten, and slashed, and a pentagram was carved into her chest. Krista then hit Colleen's skull with a large chunk of asphalt, ending her life. Now, Krista kept a piece of her skull and began to show off the 
piece of the skull around the school, and within 36 hours, the group was arrested. Now, soon after her arrest, Krista confessed to police, but insisted that they were merely trying to scare her, and it got out of control. Krista was charged with first degree homicide and conspiracy to commit homicide. On March 22, 1996, after only a few hours of deliberation, she was found guilty on both counts. On March 30th, she was sentenced to death by electrocution for the death charge and 25 years in prison for the conspiracy charge. She is currently still waiting on death row. Number two, Brandon Basham and Chadwick Folks. Samantha Burns was last seen by her aunt at the Huntington Mall at 6:30 p.m. on the evening of November 11th, 2002. At 9:45 p.m. that evening, Samantha used her cell phone to call her mother and said that she'd been visiting friends at Marshall University Courtyard Apartments, but was coming home. Unfortunately, she never arrived home and has never been heard from since. In July 2005, Chadwick Folks and Brendan Basham pled guilty to a federal charge of carjacking, resulting in death to avoid a possible death sentence. The pair had escaped from Hopkins County Jail in November 2002, and they have said that they carjacked Samantha shortly thereafter and ended her life, though her body has never been found. They are currently on death row for another homicide, that of Alice Donovan from South Carolina. And coming in at number one is Eugene Blake. On January 16th, 1967, Eugene Blake attacked Donna Jean Ball, and she was able to live long enough to say what she experienced before she passed. Eugene was then arrested, eventually convicted, and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Now, during his time in prison, he was described as a model inmate. So, in 1976, Governor of West Virginia, Arch A. Moore Jr., commuted his sentence to life with parole for his good conduct while being incarcerated, and in February 1979, Eugene was paroled. Then, in March 1982, he came across the car of Mark Withers and a girl whose name has not been disclosed. He went up to them and knocked on the window and started screaming. When Mark rolled down the window, Blake ended up shooting him and later threw his body over a fence, then took advantage of the girl and left. Then, on October 26, 1984, the body of Marianne Hope Hembright was found in West Virginia. She had evidently been taken advantage of and strangled to death. In June 1985, Blake was indicted for the death and two counts of taking advantage of her. In 1997, he pleaded guilty on all charges and was sentenced to a 15 years to life term. Then in 2008, Blake was charged with Mark's death after his DNA was linked to the crime scene. He was soon extradited to Ohio, where prosecutors sought the death penalty against him for three counts of aggravated homicide. Now, in order to avoid a potential death sentence, he pleaded guilty to all charges in 2010 and was thus given a 20 year sentence with parole eligibility, stirring controversy among locals who wish that he remained incarcerated for the rest of his natural life. And we're starting things off with David Berkowitz, aka the son of Sam. One peculiar aspect of his case was his claim that his neighbor's dog was possessed and instructed him to commit violent acts. In the mid 1970s, Berkowitz carried out a string of shootings. He was eventually arrested in 1977. And during the investigation, he admitted to the shootings and claimed that his neighbor's dog, a black Labrador retriever named Harvey, was possessed by a demon. According to Berkowitz, Harvey commanded him to take the lives of people. Berkowitz later asserted that he had started the fires in the Bronx, attributing this act to the dog's influence as well. In 1978, Berkowitz pleaded guilty to the crimes and was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences in prison. He later renounced his satanic beliefs and became involved in prison ministry, offering counseling and support to other inmates. And at number nine, we have Sean Sellers. He was a self-proclaimed Satanist who claimed to be possessed by a demon named Azeroth. In 1985, at the age of 16, Sellers took the lives of his parents, Vonda and Paul, in their Oklahoma home. Home. He later confessed to these acts, as well as having shot a convenience store clerk a year prior who refused to sell him beer. Sellers stated that his involvement in Satanism influenced his actions. According to Sellers, he believed he was possessed by the demon, which drove him to commit the violent acts. And Sellers was eventually arrested, tried, and convicted for the crimes. He was sentenced to death in 1986, and during his time on death row, he became a born again Christian and renounced his previous involvement in Satanism, but despite his change in beliefs and multiple appeals, Sellers was executed by lethal injection in 1999. Next up is Manuela and Daniel Ruda, two lovers bound together by their passion for violence in the name of the Dark Lord. 
how romantic. Manuela and Daniel Ruda were a German couple involved in a highly disturbing incident in 2001. They were responsible for the death of Frank Hackert and their reason for taking their friend's life? Well, according to the couple at the time, they thought he was so funny and would be the perfect court jester for Satan. The Rudas were deeply immersed in occult practices, spending time vacationing in England and Scotland, sleeping in graveyards and going to devil worshipping parties. The couple subjected Hacker to hours of violent rituals which tragically led to his demise. After taking Hackert's life, they stuck his body in a coffin that they used as a coffee table. They attempted to dismember his body, but they were apprehended before they could dispose of the remains. They were actually caught in a gas station and apparently they were brandishing chainsaws, like waiting for the authorities to arrive. Very insane. In 2002, they were both convicted of the crime, with Daniel receiving a prison sentence and Manuela being committed to a psychiatric institution because of her diminished mental state. She cut her ties with Daniel when he was in prison, though, and he landed himself in court once again years later when he apparently attempted to hire a hitman to take her out. True love at its finest. As insane as all this is, using a coffin for a coffee table, that is actually an awesome idea. I am taking note of that. Nikolai Ogolbiak. This next case happened in 2008 in Russia. It's pretty disturbing. Nikolai was a former choir boy turned Satanist and led a small cult of Satan worshippers. He and a few of his underlings lured four teenagers in the local goth scene into the woods, about 300 miles northeast of Moscow, where they forced them to drink alcohol before stabbing themselves 666 times each. After that, they ate parts of their victims' bodies. The group was arrested when various body parts were found in Nikolai's apartment complex. One member was quoted saying, Satan will help me avoid responsibility. I made many sacrifices to him. Another said, I tried to turn to God, but it didn't bring me any money. I prayed to Satan and things improved. It didn't improve that much because now you're in prison, but. Yeah. Number 6. The Beasts of Satan The members of the Beasts of Satan were primarily young individuals in the metal scene in Soma, Lombardo, Italy. They shared an interest in Satanism and the occult, and they believed in ritualistic practices influenced by the darker aspects of Satanic worship. One night in January of 1998, after hanging out at Midnight Pub listening to heavy metal music, three members, Andrea Volpe, Nicola Sapone, and Mario Muccione, lured two of their friends out into the woods and took their lives in a ritualistic sacrifice. They buried their bodies in the woods and then danced on their graves chanting, now you're both zombies, try to get out of this hole if you dare. Might have sounded catchier in Italian. The group got away with this initially. Authorities didn't look into the two teens disappearances because they were a couple and police were like, oh yeah, they probably ran off together. Great policing work. Then in 2004, the group's leader, Andre Volpe, uh, took the life of his ex girlfriend, believing she knew too much about the incident from seven years prior. Then he and his buddy buried the body before taking a large amount of drugs, crashing their car into a tree. The two were arrested, and during interrogations, everything came out. Next on the list is Ricky Queso. In 1984, Ricky Queso, a teenager from Northport, New York, took the life of his friend Gary Lowers. On June 16th, 1984, Queso and a group of friends, who were all part of a group they called the Knights of the Black Circle, lured Lowers to a remote wooded area. There, a conference Confrontation ensued, during which Queso and his accomplices subjected Lowers to a drawn out beating. Queso apparently tried to force Lowers into praising Satan. Lowers refused, though, repeating that he loved his mother. The entire group was high on psychedelic drugs at the time. Queso would then brag about the incident to his friends days afterwards, claiming that Satan had appeared to him in the form of a black crow. And when it cawed, he interpreted it as, as Satan giving his approval of the attack. This was at the height of the satanic panic in the US and Queso's fascination with satanic rituals and the occult and the fact that he was wearing an ACDC t-shirt when he was arrested. It all became the focal point in the media coverage of the case. And shortly after the incident, Queso was arrested and charged in connection with Lauer's demise. And before he could stand trial though, he took his own life in his jail cell on July 7th 
of 84. Number four, the Ripper Crew. The Ripper Crew was a notorious satanic cult active in Chicago during the 80s, comprising of four members, Robert Gett, Edward Spritzer, and brothers Andrew and Thomas Cocorellis. They carried out a series of heinous crimes, abducting and taking the lives of several women in the area. They followed this twisted version of Satanism, using it as a justification for their violent acts. Their leader, Robin Gett, allegedly believed that offering human sacrifices to Satan, he would then gain supernatural powers and protection. The Ripper crew targeted young women. They adopted their victims, subjected them to brutal torment, and then took their lives as part of their ritualistic practices. In 82, the police arrested Robin Gett. During his interrogation, he confessed to several crimes and provided information about the cult's activities, and this led to the arrest and conviction of the other members, including Edward Spritzer and the Coco Reilly's brothers. But it's essential to, uh, I want to say, their actions aren't really representative of mainstream Satanism. I think that this goes for everyone on this list. In real life, Satanism really is not about promoting violence. Anyway, in 83, Robert Gett was sentenced to 120 years in prison. Edward Spritzer and Andrew Cocorellis were sentenced to death, with Spritzer later receiving a life sentence after Illinois temporarily banned the death penalty, and Thomas Cocorellis was actually released from prison in 2019 for some reason. Next on the list, we have Krista Pike. In January 1995, Krista Gail Pike, who was 18 at the time, along with two accomplices, Shadola Peterson and Tadariel Ship, Pike's boyfriend, were involved in a gruesome incident that claimed the life of classmate Colleen Slemmer. Pike had a disturbing interest in Satanism and the occult and carried out the act in a particularly disturbing manner. So it all started when Slemmer seemed to be talking to her boyfriend a little too much for Krista's liking, so she formed a plan with Ship and Peterson to take Slemmer out of the picture. The trio lured Slemmer to a vacant steam plant where they violently attacked her. They beat her for 30 minutes, cut her up, even carved a pentagram into her chest. In 1996, Krista Pike was convicted of her role in the event and despite her young age, was sentenced to death. She's currently still on death row. Number two, Richard Ramirez, or he, as he became known, the Night Stalker, one of the most notorious criminals in American history. Ramirez was heavily influenced by Satanism and he often left satanic symbols at the scenes of his crimes. He was known to drop pentagrams in the walls and leave occult objects behind. Ramirez believed that he was protected by dark forces and that Satan guided his actions. During 84 and 85, Ramirez took the lives of at least 13 people in Southern California. His victims, ranging in age from 9 to 83, were subjected to brutal attacks, and in some cases, uh, he would also burglarize the people's homes. He would also force many of his victims to profess their love uh, for Satan. Unlike a lot of criminals of his kind who typically have a specific pattern to the types of people they'll victimize, Ramirez was more unpredictable. His victims were almost entirely random. Men, women, young, old, didn't matter to him. Now, the way this all ends is probably the most cathartic I've heard in any notorious criminal uh, case like this. In 1985, Ramirez was chased down by residents in East Los Angeles after they recognized him from news coverage. An angry mob formed and Ramirez was just romped on uh, until police showed up. It's like the ending of Frankenstein or something. Only Ramirez actually deserved what he got. He was unarrested, tried, and convicted. He died in 2013 while on death row in San Quentin. Finally, we have Adolfo Constanzo. This guy was a cult leader, uh, a drug trafficker, and he also practiced black magic. Man was just looking at the villain menu was like, yep, I'll have that. I'll take that. Might as well check that off as well. Uh, he was the mastermind behind a criminal organization involved in drug trafficking, and he would take victims' lives in these spooky, dark rituals. He believed that performing human sacrifices would grant him supernatural powers and protect his drug trafficking operations. Cult members followed his twisted beliefs without question, basically the definition of a cult. The cult's rituals often involved human sacrifice. Victims were often abducted or lured and then died in ceremonies aimed at appeasing deities and spirits. Their bodies were dismembered and body parts were used in the rituals. In 1989, Constanzo's criminal activities began to unravel when Mexican authorities discovered the cult's headquarters in Matamoros, Mexico, and there they found evidence of the cult's rituals, including human remains and ritualistic artifacts 
Pops. There's this big witch's type cauldron with a dead black cat and a human brain inside of it. Doesn't seem real. Constanzo and four of his followers fled, but were eventually tracked down by the police. And Constanzo he didn't want to be taken alive, and so he ordered one of his followers to shoot him. And that was the end of that. And we're starting things off with Jeronique Cunningham and Cleveland Jackson. On January 3rd of 2002, Jeronique Cunningham and his half brother Cleveland Jackson committed a violent crime in Lima, Ohio. They took the lives of three-year-old Jala Grant and 17-year-old Lanisha Williams. The victims, along with six others, were present at the house of a man targeted by Cunningham and Jackson for a robbery involving drugs and money. Following the robbery, Cunningham and Jackson opened fire on everyone inside the house. Tragically, Jala died while her father held her in his arms. Cunningham and Jackson also attempted to take the lives of the survivors, each of whom sustained gunshot injuries during the incident. Both Cunningham and Jackson were convicted, with Jackson receiving a death sentence. Cunningham is currently serving a life sentence. Next on the list is George Wagner IV. In April of 2016 in Pike County, Ohio, a gruesome incident took place, now known as the Pike County Massacre. Eight members of the Roden family were tragically taken from life in four separate homes. The victims included seven adults and a 16-year-old, all shot to death. In November of 2018, authorities arrested George Wagner III, his wife, Angela Wagner, and their two sons, George Wagner IV and Edward Wagner Jr. In connection with the crimes, the family was accused of meticulously planning and executing these attacks. Their motive was believed to be centered around child custody, financial disputes, and an illegal marijuana growing operation. Next up, we have Michael Madison. So Michael Madison, born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1977, was convicted in 2016 for the deaths of three young women in East Cleveland, Ohio. Between 2012 and 2013, he took the lives of his victims, whose remains were discovered in various locations near his residence. Madison's arrest in 20. 13 followed the discovery of the first victim's body wrapped in plastic in a garage. Neighbors had noticed a foul odor coming from his property and authorities were alerted. Their investigations continued and this led to the identification of two additional victims. Police found the remains of the second victim in a weeded lot and the third victim's body was found in a nearby abandoned house in the basement. During his trial, Madison actually smirked causing a father of one of the victims to lunge at him in anger. Luckily, that man was released without charges. Madison was found guilty of multiple charges, including aggravated murder and kidnapping. In 2016, he was sentenced to death for his crimes. Next up on the list is Donald Hoffman. Donald Hoffman was convicted of taking the lives of four men over the Labor Day weekend in 2015. He was sentenced to four consecutive life terms. The victims, Freeland Hensley, 67, Gerald Smith, 65, Billy Jack Chapman, 55, and Daryl Lewis, 65, were residents of Bucharest, Ohio. Hoffman admitted to his crimes, stating he committed the acts to fund his drug addiction. And during the slangs, Hoffman used various methods of violence. He beat Hansley with a frying pan, strangled Smith with an electrical cord, struck Smith in the head with a bottle, strangled Lewis with shoelaces, and attacked Chapman with a pry bar. Hoffman stole the victim's debit and credit cards, spending over $2,100 on drugs and cigarettes. Prosecutor revealed that Hoffman specifically targeted older men with health issues whom he knew personally. Number six, the downtown posse. During the Christmas season of 1992, the downtown posse Posse, led by Marvelous Keen, embarked on a brutal crime spree in Dayton, Ohio. The first victim was Joseph Wilkerson, a 34-year-old General Motors worker. The gang lured their way into his home where Wilkinson was shot. The gang then partied in his house for the next three days while he lay dead in a bedroom. On the same night, they took the life of 18-year-old Danita Gillette, who was uh, using a payphone. She was robbed of her belongings and lost her life despite pleading not to be harmed and cooperating as best as she could with them. The following day, the body of 19-year-old Richard Maddox, a former boyfriend of one of the gang members, was discovered. Jeffrey Wright was also shot but survived his attack, having received multiple wounds. Continuing their violent spree, the gang shot Sarah Abraham, 8-year-old mother working in a family business. Abraham succumbed to her injuries five days later. On December 26th, former Dayton Police Sergeant John Huber spotted a stolen car connected to the group. 
group. He arrested them, not yet aware of their involvement in everything else that had been going on. After their arrest, Laura Taylor, one of the members of the downtown posse, confessed to two more victims, the bodies of Wendy Cottrell and Marvin Washington, who were found uh, in a gravel pit. Taylor revealed they took them out because the gang believed they might inform the police about their crimes. Marvelous Keen, the gang's leader, confessed and was sentenced to death, with his sentence being carried out back in 2009. The other three members received life prison sentences. Next on the list is Edward Edwards, which is just the dumbest name I've ever heard. Just laziness on his parents' behalf, but that's all this guy really deserved. Born in 1933, Edwards' criminal activities started at a young age with burglaries and frauds. He was arrested multiple times over the years for various offenses, including arson, robbery. In 1961, he was convicted of arson and spent several years in prison. After being released, though, Edwards took the lives of several people, including his own adopted son. He took the lives of two different couples in the 70s, and in 1992, he ended the life of his adoptive son, Donnie Boy Edwards, committing the crime for financial gain in order to collect his $250,000 life insurance policy. Edwards' crimes went undetected for uh, many years, allowing him to continue his criminal activities, but in 2009, he was finally apprehended and charged with crimes he committed decades earlier. He was linked to the crimes through advancements in uh, forensic technology and DNA evidence. Ariel Castro. Castro was born in Puerto Rico, but he moved to Cleveland, Ohio with his mother when he was young, and this is where he would grow up to commit his crimes. Castro was responsible for the abduction and imprisonment of three women, Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Gina de Jesus. These three women were held captive in Castro's home for about 10 years. That is crazy. One of the victims, Amanda Berry, even gave gave birth to her daughter during this time. They were subjected to physical and emotional torment, which included being kept in restraints, confined to a few rooms in the house. Amanda Berry managed to escape from Castro's home in May of 2013, though. Castro had left the home for the day, and she managed to catch a glimpse of his neighbors through a screen door. She screamed for help and managed to make contact with them. All three women were luckily rescued, as well as Berry's daughter. Castro was arrested shortly after the escape in 2013 he was charged with multiple counts. To avoid the possibility of facing the death penalty, he later pleaded guilty to the charges. And in August 2013, Castro was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And, you know, just because why not? He got an additional thousand years in prison. So, yeah, safe to say he's not getting released anytime soon. Next up, we have TJ Lane. So many have heard of this case. Uh, this guy became pretty infamous for his conduct in the courtroom, where he showed absolutely absolutely zero remorse or regret for his actions, taunting the victim's families, giving the middle finger to everyone in the courtroom, and pretty astonishing, really. TJ Lane was convicted for a school shooting at Chardon, at Chardon High School in Ohio on February 27th of 2012. He opened fire in the school cafeteria, resulting in the deaths of three students and injuries to three others, one of which became permanently paralyzed. Lane was arrested the same day and later found guilty of multiple charges. In 2013, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Lane actually did manage to escape from prison in 2014, along with two other inmates. They'd used a makeshift ladder to uh, scale a fence during recreational hours. Luckily though, he was found later that night. He's now serving in a maximum security prison, the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility. Next up, we have Robert Berdella. Now, this guy died in 1992, so a return is highly unlikely, but he's got to be one of the worst criminals in Ohio's history, right up there with Dahmer, possibly even worse. He was born in Ohio in 1949, but his crimes were carried out in Kansas City between 1984 and 87. He was responsible for the deaths of at least six men. Berdella lured his victims, often vulnerable young men, to his home with promise of money or shelter, and once in his captivity, he subjected them to prolonged periods of sadistic torment. He would hold them in captivity Activity, sometimes for as long as six weeks at a time before disposing of them. His crime spree came to an end in 1988, though, when one of his victims managed to escape and alert the police. The bodies of his former victims 
were never found, unfortunately, but police did find journals and uh, Bordello had written chronicling his crimes, as well as photographs and personal belongings of the victims. Bordello was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He died in prison in 1992 due to a heart attack. Finally, we have Sean Great, eventually being sentenced to death for his crimes, having taken the life of five young women. His last victim, whose real name has been kept secret, uh, known to the public simply as Jane Doe, had met Great at the Ashland Salvation Army Ray and Joan Crock Corps Community Center. She viewed their relationship as purely platonic and would consistently reject his advances, but Great managed to lure her to his home using the ruse of offering her some clothes he claimed to have for her. Once inside though, his personality completely flipped and he attacked her. She ended up being held captive for three whole days. But there's a light at the end of this tunnel. She managed to find an opportunity to secretly contact the police while Great was asleep. This led to his arrest and the end of her nightmare. And during the legal proceedings that followed, Great was found guilty of his crimes. He's currently sitting on death row. And we're starting out this list with Grigory Rasputin, born in 1869 in a small Siberian village. He grew up as a peasant. He was also a mystic and grew up to become quite close with the Russian royal family after seeming, seemingly healed Alexei Nikolaevich, the son of Nicholas II and heir to the Russian throne. Alexei uh, was a hemophiliac, meaning his blood didn't clot properly, and Rasputin, after being called to the palace of Nicholas and Alexandra, seemed to ease his symptoms. This was miraculous, and the royal family put their full trust in this mysterious holy man who would go on to have sleeping with any woman he could within the palace, but he was also known to force himself on women. But because Nicholas and Alexandra were so enamored with his supposed power, any concern or report about him was completely written off. It seemed that everyone on the outside wanted the guy gone though, seeing how he was pulling Nicholas and Alexandra's strings, controlling them like puppets. And, and there were a number of attempts to take Rasputin's life, but this guy was hard to take down. He was stabbed and recovered, poisoned with cyanide which had no effect. He was shot and was seemingly dead before springing up like Michael Myers at the end of Halloween. He was then shot again before being wrapped up in a blanket and thrown in a river where he finally drowned. Number 9, Gil de Rey. Born in 1404, Gil de Rey was a French nobleman and a respected military leader, but he had a secret life. He was responsible for viciously taking the lives of countless young ones and was said to be a practitioner of black magic and conducted occult rituals, leading many to believe that he possessed otherworldly abilities. This guy was an absolute monster. If you want to talk about true evil, this is it right here. His servants, mostly young men, very young men, and other young ones around his castles started going missing, and rumors started to spread that Gil de Rey was disposing of them, something that turned out to be true when witnesses began seeing servants disposing of bodies. Many were afraid to speak out against him, though, due to the immense gap in class that was present at the time. He was finally arrested in 1440, though, and under the threat of excruciating punishment, he admitted to his crimes, actually revealing that he would take the lives of his victims in these dark occult-like rituals. Next on the list, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth Bathory, born August 7th, 1560, was a Hungarian noblewoman, notorious for being one of the most prolific female serial killers in history. She's, she's often remembered as the Blood Countess because of her horrifying crimes. Bathory was accused of tormenting and taking the lives of numerous young females. Her methods included severe beatings, burning, and disfigurement. And what she's most famous for, though, was her belief that bathing in her victim's blood would preserve her youth. It's said that she may have taken the lives of hundreds in her quest for eternal beauty. Her actions eventually caught the attention of authorities. In 1610, she was arrested and her accomplices were put on trial. And the accounts from witnesses and survivors 
painted a very chilling picture of her cruelty. She was never officially tried in court, but was confined to a windowless room in her castle until her death in 1614. Number 7. Aleister Crowley Crowley, born in 1875, was an English occultist and ceremonial magician who founded the religion of Thelema. He was a prominent and very controversial guy, especially at the time, known as the Great Beast 666. He was an occultist, writer, and ceremonial magician, a man of many mysteries and oddities. Crowley, Crowley was known for more than just his eccentric lifestyle, though. One of the big questions surrounding him is whether he actually had any mystical powers or was just really good at talking the talk. Crowley wasn't shy about bragging that he could communicate with supernatural beings. He claimed to have a direct line to a being named Awas, who supposedly dictated to him the Book of the Law, basically the Bible of Thelema. Then there's the curious case of his rituals. Crowley was all about strange ceremonies, often involving weird symbols and chants, and even some bizarre uh, sexual practices. As to whether he was evil, I mean, you know, some would definitely say he was, but uh, yeah, certainly not like most of the others on this list. Like this next guy, for example. And at number six, Thug Baram. Thug Baram, born in 1765, became infamous as the ruthless leader of the Thuggy cult in India during the 18th and 19th centuries. The Thuggy were a secret criminal society that specialized in robbery and murder, targeting unsuspecting travelers. What made the thuggy particularly sinister was their method. It was their method of operation. They would often befriend and gain the trust of their victims on the road, only to then strangle them with a rummel, a, a cloth, and this kind of ritualistic fashion, allowing them to carry out their crimes discreetly. Baram was one of the most notorious thuggy leaders, believed to have taken the lives of hundreds. He actually admitted to witnessing 931 people die right in front of him, and that's not even counting the ones he had a direct hand in. Under his leadership, the thugs terrorized India for years with a well-organized network that spanned the country. He was eventually captured and put to death in 1840. Next, we have H. H. Holmes. Holmes was born in 1861 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Although he was highly intelligent from a young age, he displayed all your classic disturbing signs early on. He would capture and torture animals, cutting into them and performing strange experiments. Holmes, whose real name was Herman Webster Mudgett, not quite as intimidating sounding, committed crimes that were as horrifying as they were calculated. He constructed this nightmarish castle in Chicago, specifically equipped with secret passageways and like soundproof rooms and gas chambers, which were all made to assist assist with his gruesome crimes. He would lure numerous victims, mostly young women, surprise, surprise, into his property and once inside, they came face to face with unimaginable horrors, including excruciating torment, asphyxiation, and dissection. The exact number of his victims isn't 100% known, but it could be anywhere from just nine to over 200. I'm guessing it's somewhere in between. In 1896, he was finally convicted for his crimes and sentenced to death. Number four, Gil Garnier. Here we have a real life werewolf case, at least the closest thing uh, possible. Uh, Gil Garnier, aka the Hermit of St. Bonneau and the Werewolf of Dole was a reclusive man born at some point in the mid-1500s in France. He lived in an isolated home just outside the town of Dole. His new wife moved out to the home with him, and it was at this point that something changed in Garnier. He had always hunted food for himself, but now having to provide for another person, it, it was difficult, and this started driving a wedge between him and his wife, and he started getting desperate. It was at this point that several young ones in the area started being found mauled to death with parts of their bodies having been eaten. Meaning this had to have been the work of some large animal, right? But it wasn't. It was Garnier. Garnier's crimes came to light when a group of traveling workers had spotted him eating the body of one of his victims in the dead of night. At first, they thought they were looking at a wolf. According to Garnier, he had been hunting one night when a ghostly figure came to him, telling him it would imbue him with the power to transform into a wolf, making it easy 
easier for him to hunt. Since that night, he had stalked and hunted a number of young people, most of which died as a result of his savage attacks. He was burnt at the stake in 1574, accused of lycanthropy and witchcraft. I don't know what it was with guys named Gills in uh, France back then, but uh, they didn't like young folks, apparently. Number three, Vlad the Impaler, the original vampire himself. Uh, if there's anyone in history that just feels like they stepped out of some portal from another dark dimension, it's this guy. Vlad was born in 1431. He was a tyrant renowned for his brutal methods of punishing enemies, often impaling them on long spikes. His reputation for cruelty gave rise to the legend that is Dracula, inspiring Bram Stoker's famous vampire novel. Alongside these gruesome acts, there are legends suggesting Vlad may have possessed otherworldly powers, tales that kind of hint at his ability to control the weather, or summon dark forces, or even try transform into a vampire-like creature. The line between fact and fiction often blurs with this guy. Some believe that his cruelty was more than human, that he, maybe he had something supernatural lurking inside him, some sort of dark entity from beyond. He just inspired this intense fear and awe in his time, and his brutality definitely unquestionable, but the idea of him being an actual vampire, most likely just legend, uh, but fun to imagine. And at number two, we have Jack the Ripper, a name everyone has heard before. One of the first cases uh, of the type of modern day serial killer we hear about all the time now, only this man was never identified. Jack the Ripper terrorized the Whitechapel district of London in 1888 and remains one of the most infamous figures in criminal history. Victims were taken out in the most gruesome ways possible. They looked like they had been mauled to death by a five 500 pound brown bear. A jack primarily targeted female workers of the night, brutally mutilating their bodies. The sheer level of ferocity of these attacks and the fact that he was never caught uh, really has fueled the theories and speculations over the years about him. He, he taunted the police with letters that were apparently from him, signed as Jack the Ripper. There have been intensive investigations and a number of uh, suspects that have kind of come up over the years that could have been him, but his true identity has never been definitively proven. Finally, we have Heinrich Himmler. Heinrich Himmler was a high-ranking German official during World War II. He had a deep and disturbing fascination with the occult. He believed he could summon dark forces to help him shape a new world order and try to incorporate his beliefs into the ideology of the regime. He established a uh, research institute to explore ancient and supernatural phenomena. Under his direction, he conducted these expeditions to search for evidence of Aryan origins, looking into topics like ancient artifacts, astrology, folklore, and this interest extended to the dark and the occult, as Himmler believed that tapping into these mystical forces would help the German forces gain more power and control. He promoted pseudo-scientific theories, obviously related to racial purity and mysticism, and saw the SS almost as this more modern day knightly kind of order. Uh, such a bizarre side of the Second World War. It feels like something out of Hellboy, but uh, this really was a thing. The German forces were really dabbling in this type of occult stuff at the time. Coming in at number 10 is Nikolai Yezhov. Nikolai Yezhov was a Soviet secret police officer under, including at the height of the Great Purge. He organized mass arrests, tormented, and executions, but then he fell from Stalin's good graces. He was arrested and subsequently admitting in a confession to a range of anti-Soviet activity, including unfounded arrests during the Purge. He was executed in 1940 along with others who were blamed for the Purge. Now Nikolai wasn't only ousted, executed, and disgraced along with his family. He was then methodically erased from photographs where he had previously appeared with his commander. Overnight, Nikolai went from one of the highest officers in a powerful new world order to a shadow in a poorly lit photo and a name no one dared to utter. Now, Nikolai wasn't the only person to receive this photoshop treatment, as it was common in the communist government to deny failures and make inconvenient truths, even people disappear. Now, the practice has continued 
in current communist led governments where rebellious leaders are removed by force and deleted from official documents. Coming in at number 9 is Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine LaLaurie was a sadistic serial slayer socialite who lived in New Orleans. On April 10th, 1834, a fire broke out in her mansion's kitchen and firefighters found a 70 year old black woman chained to the stove. Now she appeared to have started the fire in order to attract outside attention while the fiend was trying to save her furniture. Now the authorities were led by other slaves to the attic and they were shocked. Disfigured and maimed slaves were chained to the walls or floors. Several had been subjects to medical experiments, most likely performed by her husband who was a doctor. One man appeared to be part of some bizarre change. A woman was trapped in a small cage with her limbs broken and reset to look like a crab, and another woman with arms and legs removed and patches of her flesh sliced off in a circular motion to resemble a caterpillar. There were claims that an elderly man had his face so beaten it was indistinguishable, and one woman had her back wounded to the point where her bones were visible. Some had their mouths sewn shut and starved to death, others had their hands sewn to different body parts, and most were found dead and the remaining that that were alive were begging to die to be released from the unbearable pain. Now LaLaurie and her husband fled by boat before she could be brought to justice, leaving the butler who also participated to face the wrath of a mob that had gathered outside. Number 8. Zhang Qing. Zhang Qing was a Chinese communist revolutionary, actress, and major political figure during the Cultural Revolution. She was the fourth wife of Mao Zedong, the chairman of the Communist Party and paramount leader of China. Now, Zhang was best known for playing a major role in the Cultural Revolution and forming the radical political alliance known as the Gang of Four. Through clever maneuvering, she managed to reach the highest position of power within the Communist Party, just short of being president. It is believed that she was the main driving force behind China's Cultural Revolution, of which she was the deputy director. Now, During the Cultural Revolution, much economic activity was halted and countless ancient buildings, artifacts, antiques, books, and paintings were destroyed by Red Guards. Millions of people in China reportedly had their human rights annulled during this time, and millions more were also forcibly displaced. Estimates of the death toll of civilians and Red Guards from various Western and Eastern sources are about 500,000 in the true years of chaos of 1966 to 1966. 1969, but some estimate as high as 3 million deaths, with 36 million being prosecuted. Number 7. Jang Song Tech Jang Song Tech was the uncle of the current dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong Un. He was more focused on following in the ways of his brother, Kim Jong Il, something that the new dictator didn't agree with. Now, at the beginning of his rule, Kim Jong Un was still considered quite young for his political position, and some of his choices were questionable at best. Seeing that his uncle didn't agree with him, he had him tr tried by a special military tribunal and executed by a firing squad. Now, after his execution, Kim ordered all media outlets within North Korea to remove any sort of record of him, and that included any sort of pictures or information from history books. Number 6. Peter Burnett Peter Burnett was an American politician who served as the first elected governor of California from December 20th, 1849 to January 9th, 1851. Now in 1848, he moved to California during the height of the California Gold Rush. He was appointed to serve on the Supreme Court of California, and even though he had enslaved two people to make California a slave state, instead pushing for a total exclusion of African Americans in California. Governor Peter signed into the law the so-called Act for the Government and Protection protection of Indians, which enabled the enslavement of native Californians and contributed to their genocide. He declared in an 1851 speech that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate the results but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power and wisdom of man to avert. Now, Efforts by federal negotiators to preserve some native land rights were fought by the administration of Peter who favored the elimination of California's indigenous peoples. Now, he also passed the Foreign Miners Act which taxed only Chinese and Mexicans, deliberately designed to drive them out of the gold fields. Now a wave of violence against them took place before and after. Number 5. H. H. Holmes H. H. Holmes was a con artist who liked to take the lives of people. Until his execution in 1896, he chose a career of crime including insurance fraud, 3-4 to four illegal marriages, horse theft, and ending the lives of many. He claimed to have ended the lives of 27 people before he was arrested, tried 
tried and executed. He constructed a hotel of horrors, later known as the Murder Castle, to target guests visiting the Windy City during the 1893 World Fair. Now, the building was equipped with soundproof rooms and had gas lines that could be used to asphyxiate guests. It also had trap doors and a secret series of tunnels that Holmes could use to, sp to spirit away their bodies, which he was believed to have dissected and sold. Now, in the basement were a dissecting table, stretching rack, and industrial oven. On May 7th, 1896, Holmes was executed, and in 2017, amid allegations that Holmes had in fact escaped execution, his body was exhumed for testing. Did his coffin being contained in cement, his body was found not to have decomposed normally. His clothes were almost perfectly preserved, and his mustache was found to be intact. Now his body was positively identified by his teeth as being that of Holmes, and he was then reburied. Number 4. Ante Pavelic Ante Pavelic was a Croatian politician who founded and headed the fascist ultranationalist organization known as the Ustashi in 1929 and served as a dictator of the independent state of Croatia, also known as the NDH. Ante and the Ustashi prosecuted many racial minorities and political opponents in the NDH during the war, including Serbians, Jewish and Romi people, and anti fascists, becoming one of the key figures side of Serbians. At the behest of the German senior Ustashe Slavo Kosmic declared the NDH's establishment on April 10, 1941 in the name of Ante. Ante then returned from Italy and took control of the puppet government. He created a political system similar to that of fascist Italy and Germany. After taking control, Ante imposed largely anti-Serbian and anti-Semitic policies that resulted in the deaths of over 100,000 Serbians and Jewish people in concentration and extermination camps in the NDH, which resulted resulted in the torment and deaths of several hundred thousand Serbians, along with tens of thousands of Roma and Jewish people. Now, Following the surrender of Germany in May 1945, he fled and ironically, on April 10th, 1957, a Serbian hotel owner attempted to end his life by shooting. Him. Now, initially surviving, the resulting injuries would lead to his death on December 28th, 1959. Number three, General Yahya Khan. General Yahya Khan was a Pakistani military officer who served as the third president of Pakistan from 1969 to 1971. Now, he also served as the commander in chief of the Pakistan army from 1966 to 1971. Now, along with Tika Khan, he is considered the chief architect of the 1971 Bangladesh genocide. Yahya Khan's presidency oversaw marital law by suspending the constitution in 1969. Holding the country's first general election in 1970, he delayed the power of transition and in March 1971, Khan ordered Operation Searchlight in an effort to suppress Bengali nationalism. This led to the Bangladesh Liberation War in March 1971. Now Khan was central to the perpetration of Bangladesh genocide in which around 300,000 to 3 million Bengalis died and between 200,000 to 400,000 women were taken advantage of. In December 1971, Pakistan carried out preemptive strikes against the Bengali allied Indian army, culminating the start of the third Indian Pakistan war. Now this the wars resulted in the surrender of Pakistan and East Pakistan seceded as Bangladesh. After Pakistan's surrender, Khan resigned from the military command and transferred the presidency. Khan's short regime is regarded as the leading cause of the breakup of Pakistan. He is viewed negatively in both Bangladesh being considered the chief architect of genocide and in Pakistan. Pakistan. Number two, Pol Pot. Pol Pot was a Cambodian revolutionary, dictator, and politician who ruled Cambodia as the Prime Minister of Democrat Kapuchea between 1976 and 1979. He was a leading member of Cambodia's communist movement, the Khmer Rouge, from 1963 to 1997 and served as General Secretary of the Communist Party of Kamchia from 1963 to 1981. Now, his administration converted Cambodia into a one party communist state and perpetrated treated the Cambodian genocide. Pot planned to turn Cambodia into a simple, agrarian, and socialist society. He forced the urban population, such as teachers, doctors, and other professionals, into the countryside, onto collective farms, and executed anyone who complained or broke rules by a pickaxe. There was more than 150 detention centers for any dissidents. S21, the most notorious one, had seven survivors out of 20,000. Others were taken to fields, executed, and buried in mass graves. Now, he also outlawed religion, most reading, money, and anything private, and strictly governed sexual relations, vocabulary, and clothing. Out of a country of not even 10 million people, it's estimated up to 3 million people died in just 3 years. Number 1. Queen Ravanaloa Queen Ravanaloa was known as the Mad Queen of Madagascar, and I feel like that explains a lot. 
She finally ascended to the throne on August 4th, 1829, where she immediately took out all her rivals. She had expelled the European merchants, teachers, diplomats, and trade deals with Britain and France were immediately cancelled. After one successful battle against an invasion, she slit the heads of Europeans, stuck them on pikes, and lined them in the beaches. Now She also banned the teachings of Christianity, and she had many evil techniques to punish people as her descendants and criminals would be dumped slowly in boiling water or oil or tied down with ropes and burned alive. She would place others into coffins, and some were buried into holes with dirt showered upon them. She sold her subjects into slavery to boost her country's economy, which involved brutal labor conditions, staying far away from homes, and malnutrition related deaths. Now, these people were either considered traitors, victims of war, non taxpayers, or Christians who secretly practiced their religion. Her reign brought down the nation's population from 5 million to 2.5 million at the end of her rule. Thank you.